One, and we are live with Susan Ramlett. Susan, how are you this morning? I'm doing great. Thanks, Kelly. Susan is a, uh, what, what is your title at Medtronic? Is it director or senior director? Or? Uh, senior IT manager for user experience research and design. Okay. So that's a that's a mouthful. And along with that, you are on the <laughs> state of Minnesota Technology Advisory Board. Technology Advisory Council. Yes, it's a governor council. appointed council for advising uh, Minute, which is the IT division of the state of Minnesota on, okay. on technology matters. What what kind of technology matters come in front of you? Is it any anything and everything kind of technology? Uh, technically, probably, but the council is divided up into subcommittees. So there are areas of focus every year for the, for the, um, for the council. For example, right now we have a subcommittee in cybersecurity. We have one for project to product. We have one for customer experience of which I'm a co-chair and there's a fourth one now, which is, um, as you might expect, AI, artificial intelligence. So we tend to focus on topics that fall under those particular categories uh, and, and work with the agencies to have them share information, have them receive guidance, inform uh, hopefully some budgetary decisions that get made about where focus is spent by the state, by the IT um, group of the state. So That's it's been a yeah. lot of fun. very cool, and I'm going to ask you some more questions about that a little later. Sure. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about your your background. I noticed you were a musician, and <laughs> and is it you're a singer? Are you a, do you play any instruments? Are you a classically trained singer? What's what's your music background? Yeah, I'm a classically trained singer. So I, um, yeah, that's that's actually what my degree is in, which makes perfect sense that I'm in technology now. Yep. It does make there. sense. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there is a lot of affinity there. I know a lot of a lot of musicians in this field, and and vice versa. But um, yeah, I'm an aspiring cellist, but I'm really just learning. I've not had it. I've not had an instrument other than voice for most of my career. Are you? Uh, are you like a? Do you listen to Yo Yo Ma for the cello, or who, oh, who do you listen? Absolutely. Yeah. I okay. Mean, oh, he's amazing. Did Absolutely. he inspire you or who inspired you to, to grab the cello? I don't know that there's any particular person that inspired me. I've always had an affinity for the um, for the lower, richer register instruments, whether that's vocal instruments or other kinds of instruments, um, bassoon, cello, string bass, etc. And uh, I actually married a bass <laughs> singer. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I, I the, the cello... And, and string instruments tend to mimic the human voice in the way that they produce sound. And so I think I'm drawn to that as a singer because they, I feel like they, um, they're closest to the human voice in what they, in, in how they um, sound really. And, and so I've been enjoying learning how to play that for the last, I don't know, two or three years. I'm still an amateur and not all that great, but it's been a lot of fun to learn something different and to, to yeah. really Something that I'm only going to get better at. <laughs> so well, such a I, and my favorite instrument too, by the way, is probably the cello. I, I love the cello, the texture of the way oh, it, yeah. the strings vibrate in the mm -hmm. that you know it, it's it's a it, your body feels it, your ears Absolutely. feel it. It's such a such a beautiful mellow, but with a lot of textured kind of sound. And and you put a mm -hmm. violin in with that to take more of the high end stuff and. Really is an incredible, oh, it incredible is. sound when you get plus, great plus players. You can sit down while you're playing it. <laughs> well, there you go. But yeah, that's I think for anybody who has tried to pick up a a cello or a violin and and tried to make sound out of it and play it, they can appreciate the absolute level of of dedication that's required to get quality sound out of, of those kind those that's kind of true. instruments. We I'm a guitar player. Yeah. We went through years of, uh, I have a, a son who's a violinist, and so we went through years of his learning violin and struggling with, with some of that. And it's, um, so I knew what was coming. I knew, I knew what it takes to, to be really good, and he's quite accomplished. Um, so it's been fun to do that at, uh, as an adult, to learn something new. I'm a guitar player, so you can see 
You can oh, see yeah. the guitar. You can see the guitars <laughs> in the background there. My yeah. mom was a, my mom was a music teacher, so but you have frets. It's so much easier to get a sound out of a guitar. Um, and I play violin, and I've played the cello. Oh, sure. You know, and I can make sounds out of them, and I can, um, you know, you can recognize Mary had a little lamb and those. <laughs> well, I mean, they're yeah. hard instruments to get quality <laughs> sound out of. You know, it's 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 all a joke till you get a bow handed to you and you have to try to get it the bow in a condition where you can actually get a quality sound and fret right. and, and go from a, a you know, one note to the other note, you know. It's just, right. I think it's a it's just very challenging. Well well and the things that you just don't know about it until you get into the domain, such as the fact that the quality of the bow matters more than the quality of the instrument when you're choosing an instrument. And I I, I should say almost more, <laughs> probably more. Yeah, certainly you need a you need a good quality instrument, but the bow can make or break the sound of an instrument, and it's pretty. That was pretty interesting to learn. Yeah, we traveled. My wife and I traveled to Cremona, Italy, which is the home of Stradivarius oh. and Amati. Amati was the uncle of Stradivarius, and he really trained Stradivarius how to make um, the instruments. And so that town of Cremona, Italy, has incredible you know instrument makers and they have the bows you know and so equal with the bows are they're or equal with the instruments they're showing the bows and how you know the bows were made and how these great masters made the bows and and there's a in fact we toured a a handmade bow um i wouldn't call it a factory it's a workshop it's luthiers wow. bow luthiers that are mm -hmm. still by hand making you know the best bows in the world for people so it was pretty cool that's amazing, and it does. It makes it. It can make a difference from one bow to the next, in in what the instrument sounds like. I would yeah. recommend anybody visiting Italy, it, it, stop by Cremona. It's not a spot that a lot of people stop by, but all, you know they've got a Stradivarius museum there that you can walk around. You'll see all the great violin makers uh, that have instruments there, armed guard with. AK-47s, you know, walking around because right. you've got all these multi, multi-million dollar right. violins from Amadi and Stradivarius. And, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's pretty cool. So tell me about your work with user-centered design, uh, because I, when people say they do that, I, I always wonder who, how, is it is it a look thing? Is it a feel thing? When you're doing user-centered design, is it is the first thing the functionality and and you get someone who doesn't know the application and you see hey can this person actually find things or like how how do you approach at a very high level how do you approach an application to make sure people actually can use it and it is the best design possible yeah that's a wow how long do we have <laughs> <laughs> Another ten minutes, all I the time know, in the world. It's a very high level. It's like, ooh, <laughs> let, me, let me bring it up a bit. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, it's it's really a life cycle thing. It's throughout a product when you think about um, how the human's going to interact with it. So, for example, um, starting with understanding the problem to be solved, and the and the users that are your target, and so there are research techniques and and strategy techniques and workshopping and things that we can do as practitioners in this space to understand the end user community, what their needs and expectations are, what their journeys are. You may have heard of journey mapping. It's kind of trendy right now um, mm -hmm. to, to look for those pain points that we can solve for the end users. So it's a matter of uh, bringing that lens of user needs to, in, in my case, the IT solutioning. So in IT, we tend to be very focused on technology and the solution. And did we deliver to the requirements? And did we deliver our project on budget and, and, and on time? And what our lens that we bring to the project is, yes, and can the users do what they need to do? Are they delighted? Are they more efficient? Are they more effective? So we have ways of managing that through the life cycle of a project uh, uh, or, or, or a product if you're in more of a product model. So understanding those user needs at the beginning, doing the due diligence to do that research, right along with a sales rep, look at a day in the life, do some surveying, do some interviews, understand really what are their needs and expectations, marry those to the business needs and the technology constraints or, um, or opportunities that are offered by the technology, and then test and validate that with end users. So yeah. um, a lot of people think of, what we do as 
when we say UX, they think of design. Like you say, the visual aspects of it. What does the button look like? What are the, how are the pages laid out? But um, And that stuff's really important, and that's a part of it. But the work that you do before you design and the work that you do after you design are equally important. And those often get overlooked in in the world that I live in. So usability testing is a big part of what we do. Um, yeah, so, so it's an interesting field to be in. I've been in it for a good portion of my career, um, almost 20 years at Medtronic in IT. So I'm pretty passionate about this particular area. Um, and, and especially in an IT organization where we tend, as I say, to focus on technology more than experiences. And so bringing that lens to what we deliver as an IT organization is really helpful. And that's, that's what I bring to the state as well, is that focus on customer experience and user experience and also digital accessibility, which is a, a, a facet of that, making sure that whatever we are delivering is also accessible to people with disabilities using assistive technology. So following standards and design and so on. Yeah, you know, I know as a user, I really consider any application or website successful based on how easy it is to get around. And, and it's not typically the technology that makes it exciting or functional for me. It's so much more about how easy is it to find things? Are there little automated scripts that give me a response? You know, stuff that's not blazing new technology. It's old technology and could be done with old technology. But I consider, you know, a good or a great experience um, on though on me versus, you know, I really don't care what's behind. I don't care if it's right. on the cloud now and that you're right. using the latest, greatest AI models to, right. to somehow, you know, take my data and stuff it in a box so you can somehow market to me at a later time. That's true. I, I, I really just don't care at all about that. So I, I do, I, I'm fascinated with how people in your world deal with, the the multiple ranges of users that end up at a website you know you have in a medtronic you might have a doctor you have salespeople, you have people with heart conditions that are coming from all walks of life you know how how you're able to create something that appeals and is intuitive and usable for that wide range of people just to me seems like it has to right. be a pretty monumental kind of task. Maybe it's just simplifying it and making it as logical as, as possible. And you hit the 90% and, or the 98%. Yeah, and... that is, there's definitely some of that. I mean, one, one of the analogies that we like to use is it's a lot like designing a home. So an architect is going to come to your home, hopefully, and consult with you and say, what do you like? What do you want? What are you looking for? A big house, how many bedrooms, etc." And then they're going to look around your space, hopefully, and say, Oh, you cook a lot. You have a lot of pans, but not enough room for them. Maybe we need to give you a bigger kitchen. What are your priorities? Are you going to have kids? Do you have pets? So understanding the needs and expectations before they go away and start sketching stuff. And they're going to just sketch stuff and go, how's this? Oh, okay, no, let's change. Okay, how's this? And that's cheap, right? You can change designs in that sense all you want, and it's fairly cheap when you're doing it on paper. Once you've built something, it's really hard to change it. So doing that due diligence up front of understanding, you know, and then at some point they create a blueprint. And basically that's like, let's make sure that the bathroom door doesn't open into the toilet. Right. Let's make sure that the room flow makes sense to people. And let's do that on paper and before we actually build anything on the construction site. And so that's a lot of really what we do, but with technology, we go through those stages of understanding the users, doing sketches, doing some blueprinting, making sure that the flow of information and like you say, the findability of things, intuitive navigation, that I don't get stuck in a dead end, making sure that those things are in place. And then we can worry about what color the countertops are and what, what finishes we have on the handles and those kinds of things. Those are important. The aesthetics are important to the experience as well. I want to be delighted with the space I'm in, but if the door opens into the toilet, that's a fundamental problem that we right. need to do <laughs> before we worry about that kind of stuff. So it's a very, very similar analogy. Susan, I have lots of follow-up questions. Our time is up for our 15 minute YouTube and, and, uh, 
all the other platforms, uh, time limits. Thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. For everyone else out there, you are watching the vodcast.